such a neat thing in this um, world we live in today is dealing with companies that are real people. Yeah. 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 I'm sure that's true. You know, there's, there's, um, many, many good people in our country yet. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. We, we get led to believe otherwise sometimes, but it's mostly good. Yeah. Yes, I know sir. a lot of good people. Amen. And folks that help others every day and are doing their yeah. best out there. Yep. Do the right thing all the time. Yep. That's true. I enjoy, um, we have a, um, about a, I think it's over 10,000 square foot retail store. That's part of our building. Uh -huh. And I meet some of the best people, not only just local people, but people driving through town on their way to the beach. A lot of folks mm. drive through Dothan and I really enjoy yeah. meeting all those folks. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. Right. I, I think that, um, for those that we encounter on on a, on that on those occasions when we, we don't care to be in their midst we um can remember that our lord just gives us the grace to continue and yeah uh, and just accept them for who they are and let's leave the rest alone and yep. get past it and wait for the next good person to come through the door <laughs> yep and spread joy like my amen um, core values I want to be a maximum resource for others and an encourager and that's kind of my core value every day is to be an encourager well I think that you find that people gravitate towards you when you do that too yeah happy people draw happy people or yep. can actually that's make other people happy so that's yeah. a good thing yeah I've never um, frowned at anybody and got a smile in return yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and my kids um I, I one time they were younger and talking about what great friends they are they had and one of them said something about well i guess we're just lucky and i said you're not lucky you're a, you're you're a mirror and what you attract is what you get so if yeah. you're kind to people you'll attract kind people that's very true that's very very true good advice so but we are live everywhere and um this is Ruth Jeffers. If you're just tuning in, welcome to live shopping. And are we live on Instagram yet? No, we can't. We're not on Instagram. Oh, that's right. When we have two people, we're not live on Instagram. Okay. Um, Facebook. Yep, we're live on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, welcome. We have a really special guest today that we have been super excited to have this week. He is from Texas, and he is Ward Hyde. He is the founder of Iconoclast boots the world famous iconic iconoclast boots so welcome glad to have you ward thank you very much miss ruth i'm proud to be here appreciate having you what's what's the temperature like in what it's, in what city in texas are you located we're we're, we're we're south of fort worth about 30 miles a little town called alvarado uh we're not far off i-35 so um north texas essentially and uh, it's warm um yeah. i don't I, I don't think we're setting any records like some people want to think that there's they are today <laughs> with the heat wave going on in the country but it's it's normal here so you know low 90s mid 90s little humidity but um it's what it is so it's it's all good wonderful well and i want to mention to folks um the iconoclast boots are on sale for 20 percent off today only and this is kind of a once in a lifetime kind of thing but it's a once in a lifetime kind of thing to have the founder on live shopping with us today um, but would you share a little bit, I know a lot of the writers, and in fact, um, who was it you were saying was, um, um, you say, posting videos today? Jessie Lynn. Jessie Lynn, she's a former Miss Rodeo America. She was posting some videos today about how much she loves Iconoclast Boots. But tell us what makes a Iconoclast Boots special. Yeah, exactly. You know, Miss 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 Ruth, the simplest the simplest thing about the Iconoclast is it's it is the solution to a problem, and that's that's why it exists in the market. the The problem being that whenever we use something else on the horse's leg, there was no support, at least not proper support, and so the Iconoclast is designed in a way that actually gives the fetlock or the sesamoidal region to the horse's leg proper support while it's in motion and that and that and only that is what sets it up sets it apart in the market so the configuration of the x out in front of that boot um <clears throat> the double sling straps that is what is the support mechanism for the boots and when we do that in that configuration it's much like taping our own ankle if we we're ever in a place where we had um 
you know, sprained ankles and that sort of thing, and uh, or in sports or or or, or some sort of uh, uh, adventure, we had to taper ankle. That was the design that we used was a crisscross fashion that pulled up at 45 degrees. So the boots are designed to do exactly that to the horse's essentially the horse's ankle, and um, it's very very effective to the point that it will preserve the integrity of that joint to about 99 percent and wow. help that horse to avoid hyperextension of that fetlock and in doing so um we reduce the injury opportunity like i say by 99 percent so um the the thing that we find out about performance horses and large is that 16 to 18 percent of those horses are going to experience soft tissue damage at some point in their career and um obviously if they're using the iconoclast boot they won't have that experience or very good chance they won't have that experience. There's some other factors that can affect those uh, soundness problems, but um, if all things are, are, are relatively proper, the horse should never experience a soft tissue uh, uh, breakdown in his career wearing that boot. So our suggestion has always been that we start horses young, um, you know, profession, uh, uh, horses that are uh, uh, high performance horses uh, being ridden at a younger age, um, we like to suggest that those uh, owners and trainers put those these uh, boots or the horses in these boots early on as soon as they start demanding um, a lot of flexation at the hawk and um, and maneuvers and avoid the possibility of of hyperextension and so um, again like I, I say when they when they do that they don't run into soft tissue problems so um, if we go back in time the term for the covering on a horse's leg was mostly splint boot, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we get f referred to as splint boots from time to time, but we really kind of like people to refer them, refer to them as a support boot as opposed to a splint boot. But a splint boot, a uh, splint boot was designed to s protect the splint bones on a horse's leg. And um, uh, splint bones on a horse's leg, there's, there's two on each leg inside, outside, uh, all four legs. So if that comes into contact with the outside foot or the offside foot, that splint bone can uh, get fractured. And so the splint boots that were manufactured for so many years were designed to protect that splint bone. And they did an excellent job, still do an excellent job protecting splint bones, but they never did provide support for the sesamoidal region. So those things are, are what really sets it apart. It's a completely different uh, piece of equipment than a splint boot. Okay. What um, what led you to design that first splint boot, or how did Iconoclast become a company? <laughs> so um, back in 2007, I, and I, I try not to age or uh, age myself, but um, in, in 2007, um, for my wife's, uh, birthday present, I, I was going to have a horse ready for her to show in the uh, Cutting Horse Futurity in Fort Worth. And um, we got two weeks out of the, uh, prior to the Futurity and the horse tore suspensory ligament. And um, went to the doctor and he said, look, um, if we do X, Y, Z, we maybe can get the horse back in the uh, show pen but not likely. And so I asked him the pointed question, why is it that if I'm using everything that the industry tells me I'm supposed to use to protect my horse, why does it not work? How did, I, how did we end up with this injury if this stuff is supposed to help us avoid these things? And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, Ward, this stuff doesn't work because it can't, it's not designed to work. Oh, wow. And so, you know, goofy me and so i asked him the next question well what does it take to make it work and his explanation was if we had some sort of configuration to the straps on a on a on leg gear that could lift and support or cradle the fetlock or the sesamoidal region he said i think we could avoid 90 percent or more of the injuries that go on in horses by and large in any discipline out there so um I guess I took that as a challenge. So um, I came home and I had 
you know, bits and pieces from all these different boots that we used in our training program and that kind of thing. And I started cutting things apart and sewing things together and doing things in trial and error. And I came up with something that I thought would work. And so at the time, we actually had two horses that were in the futurity that year, both horses in the pr two weeks prior to the, the, the show tore suspensory. So I had two. And then a neighbor gal had a barrel horse that tore a suspensory and she wanted to know if I would bring it to my house and care for it. And uh, she actually bought it from me. So she gave it back to me and I said, well, okay. So I had three. And so I sewed together these hand-sewn boots and used them to rehab those three horses. And at the eight, end of eight months, those horses were 100% sound with no scar tissue on the damage and are still sound today. And wow. so um, when I took the horses back to our veterinarian, Dr. Chris Ray at the time, um, he did the sonograms on those horses and he, he was completely bewildered and asked how the devil we did what we did. And um, I said, well, I took your advice and I came up with this thing and here's how I did it. And so I showed him my little pro prototype boots and he thought it was remarkable. Um, so he looked at me and he said, gosh, if you can find some way to make those commercially, we can sell them at the clinic all day long because they serve a lot of horses. Mm -hmm. And so my wife and I had never been in a retail business. We didn't know anything about it and um, nor manufacturing and all those sorts of things. So um, we thought, well, maybe we could try it. So we jumped out and I ended up, you know, on a plane to China and these different places looking at manufacturing stuff and trying to figure things out. And so that's what led us into it. Um, it was by the grace of God that we've, that we were able to get off the ground and by the grace of God, we still continue. And um, I, I think at the end of the day, we're here with Iconoclast to help people help horses. And um, as, as much as we have to share to, to help your horse, we also have um, the, the, the desire to help people understand how the mechanism works, how to go through recoveries, how to prevent these problems and keep your horses safe. And so, um, yeah, it's been a fun, fun journey now. And so um, we, we uh, actually filed for a patent in 2007 or eight, and then um, um, it took a long time to get a patent. It was difficult, and we achieved that in, in about 2013 or some such thing. And um, so uh, we, we acquired our patent, and, and we've not looked back since. So um, we're, we're, we're blessed, to say the least. Wow. That's yeah. pretty neat. And did you have any design in, um, that background in engineering or sewing or anything like that? or just Oh, Lord, no. Lord, no. If you saw me sew, you'd know that I couldn't. And I, I mean, I could barely tie a shoe. I, I wear boots for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I, no, I, I, we didn't have any experience. My wife was a, a, a television uh, commercial producer for 35 years. So she knows a bit about film and, and, uh, and budgets and that sort of stuff. But she, and, and she's an avid horsewoman and, and very accomplished in that regard. But now no, nothing about um, and, and I have to say, you know, growing up with my family's ranch, we grew up with horses and we had lots of horses. And, and in my lifetime, I've had thousands of horses and, and, you know, to go through and to raise and do different things with. But I never really was educated about the anatomy of the horse. Um, mm -hmm. I knew what I should do with it when I got on its back. But short of that, I really didn't know a lot. So the learning curve took a steep incline, a, a big change to, to try to figure out how everything works, why it works the way it does, and what we do to um, avoid things and um, make the horse better. And so, um, yeah, that, that set us out on a whole new endeavor in life. It's a great journey. And um, uh, we've got relationship with, uh, relationships with horses all or people all over the country um, in the professional fields, medicine fields, and you know veterinarians and that sort of thing, surgeons, and and we have in-depth conversations about what to do and how to manage and how to recover and rehab and and um, all that sort of stuff. So we've got a wealth of information, and we encourage always people um, out there if they have an injured horse, we offer a, a what we call a rehabilitation boot along with our orthopedic boots. So we have two models, right? We have an orthopedic boot that we use every day to prevent injuries um, and during our riding activities. 
And then we have a rehabilitation boot in case somebody ends up with a horse that is injured um, mm -hmm. to use on those horses when they're in recovery. And so we, we offer a chance for, for people to, to, to use these things, but a lot of times they don't understand the details of what it takes to come through recovery. And so we welcome always, and, and I take these calls personally. So if someone calls here with an injured horse and they're not sure what to do with it, it I will have an in-depth discussion with them to try to get them off on the right track so that they get the right thing done with their horse. So, and, and, and that's been a mainstay in our business since the onset. So um, we're always here for a phone call. And, and when you call Western Legacy Sales or Iconoclast, you're calling my sale number. And, wow. uh, and, and so I pick up the phone. And so, you know, we're, we're a small company in some regards, I suppose you could say, but we're very focused first and foremost on customer service in our business. And so everyone that we get to deal with between my wife and I, we are the ones that make the decisions about how those people are going to get treated and what they're going to be, uh, you know, what they're going to get from us. And, and we try to keep long-term relationships. We sponsor quite a number of people around the country in different disciplines. And I will say to you that we have never separated from anybody we've ever sponsored. So we stay with them. We're, we're very committed to and loyal to what we do. And we are to our customers as well. And, and I would, I would do uh, most anything to make sure that we secure our customers. And, and I think that falls into, you know, like with your, your company, uh, Ruth, the, the, the customers are very, very important. And customer satisfaction um, has to be a mainstay in our business so that we can have longevity. And so we see it that way. And most of our retail partners are, that I know of are all that way. And um, it makes for a big family of people that will support each other during the process of owning their horse. So um, God be the glory. Yeah. We're, we're, we're happy to be where we are. Yeah, I know. Several things. It, uh, it's interesting because when we were kids, um, and up until I was in high school, and we were pretty good size by that time, doing sometimes thousands of orders in a week, um, the phones would roll over in the evenings to the house, and that was before cell phones. And we're high school kids, and we had to answer our home phone after six o'clock. Thank you for calling, Jeffers. This is Ruth. May I help you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's it was it was it was a, it was a fun thing to learn about, wasn't it? It, it, it was, so, and so, you know, so we had order with... forms by every phone, and yeah. so finally yeah. we moved it to where they didn't roll over at night. My mom had had one too many um, folks call her with a little too much to drink in the middle of the night to place an order at 2 a.m., and at that point, <laughs> they decided to turn off the phones at, yeah. I think it was 10 or 11. Well, I, I know that we, we like so many, we um, startup companies because we weren't, you know, we didn't come from a manufacturing background and we didn't come from uh, engineering backgrounds and we didn't come from warehousing or any kind of backgrounds of, of retail storage or, or uh, those sorts of things. And so we didn't own, we didn't own a, 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 a big shop facility and we didn't have machinery and we didn't have these things. And so, and I'm not ashamed to say it, our first orders, we had product in the garage and yep. we moved the cars out and that's where we did our business was out of our garage and one of the uh, bedrooms spare bedrooms in our house made the office and um and and that's where we were and we were there for a good while and yep. um you know praise the lord we're not there today but um um it, it was a humble start and and we did what we could with what we had and, and tried to make the best of it for everybody you know i have to say that at one time about how things go and how important it is. Um, AAEP, um, the um, Equine Practitioners Symposium, they have every year in a different city. And there's probably 12, 1,500, 2,000 vets in attendance when they have the AAEP. Uh, AAEP convention. And um, the first year I put out Iconoclast boots, someone on in that crowd, some doctor, brought the Iconoclast boots to the floor and uh, for discussion. And in that discussion, 
the um, they generally roll through different subject matters through through the those those simps. Bless you, bless you. And Thank you. so in that time, the iconoclast boots then held the floor for over an hour. The discussion on the support mechanism of the boot, which one of the doctors at AEP come back and 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 let me know because I wasn't at the meeting, but uh, he came back and said, "Do you realize?" that it, the subject matter of your boots and the support that it brings to the horse's leg held the floor for over an hour with with you know 1500 doctors in discussion wow. and i was astounded by that because he said it's rare he said it's rare to get a get a product to the floor at the aep convention and hold discussion for 15 minutes and he said the dang discussion went for over an hour about that benefit from that product on a horse and what it could possibly mean to the industry. And so we were really excited when we found that out and, and, and thought, wow, this is a great jumping off point, you know? And so um, one of the things that, um, that I was able to garner from all of that was that if I'd gone into, and I used to make lots of sale calls, you know, and um, I'd go in just cold into a, 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 t a tax store and ask if they would put my product in their store. And the, I remember this individual, I won't say his name, but this individual said, look at the walls, would you? Do, do, does it look like I need more splint boots in this store? And this guy had three huge walls that were just covered in splint boots. And, and I looked at him and I said, um, you know, you do have a lot of splint boots here, but when I look it over, there's not one support boot in the building. So you don't have everything there is to cover a horse's leg. And he took a beat and he looked at me and he went, you know what? That makes sense to me. I'll put them in the store. Yeah. Oh, so we, awesome. we, we got them in the store, but you know, it, it's just that sort of thing. And, and, and so in, in my mission to try to help people help horses, um, I find a lot of times I'm trying to explain the necessity for support or what that actually means and what products out there do something and what don't. And um, in that discussion about splint boots, as an example, they're patented according to their claims and they do what their claims say they're supposed to do. But if, you, if anybody were to read the claims on a, <clears throat> on a pair of splint boots, you'll find out that the claims don't, don't offer support at all. Yeah. You know, the outside on the packaging may have changed to somebody said support. But the fact of the matter is, when you look at the claims and the details of the patent, it never claimed to support that, the mechanism. So it was never designed to do that, which isn't a bad thing. It just wasn't needed at the time. That wasn't the emphasis. So um, anyway, um, with ours, of course, the claims are different and, the, and, the, and all the packaging does or says what it does. But it leads us into the discussions about what is it that we use and why, why does it not work or will it work or whatever. And so we get into these discussions with polar wraps where, where people say, well, it's a polar wrap. And, it, and if you know how to put it on, then it's a, then it works. And, and I've got into some discussions where guys were, were pretty emotional about telling me how much they really work. And, I'd, and then I'd start offering them why it couldn't work. And so yeah. then um, when they saw the light, they really backed down. And went, I guess I'm corrected then. So, um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing when you start dissecting what the function actually is. So you got a boot, you got a boot showing there. Yeah. So I thought yeah. I'd share with it so you could kind of talk about the functionality as far as, you know, why it's special. Um, yeah. So if you look at the, uh, like Miss Ruth's holding up the boot with it, with it open and it's showing, it's showing the interior of the boot. If you look at the bottom of the boot, there's two vertical pleats. Those pleats fit at the base of the fetlock on the horse. The pleat to the uh, left or camera left is a horizontal pleat. If, if when you put the boots on a horse's leg, you put that horizontal pleat at the center or just up of center on the fetlock and you'll have the boot in proper position when you go to attach it. And then to attach, you'd, you'd put that pleat on the fetlock and then start wrapping the straps around the boot and attaching them fairly snug. You don't want to ever have the boot slide or roll or do any of those things while you're going. So it should stay in position the whole time. 
and you should never get any dirt down in behind it. It should never be loose enough to allow dirt in it. The little patch on the back is a, a flexible Kevlar patch that's there to help keep the back of that boot from wearing on the dirt. And um, we find that it's made a significant difference. It doesn't inhibit the protective or the supportive nature of the boot. So um, it, it's uh, essential to, the, to, to, the, to, to, pres to preserving it as it is today. So um, then on the outside, of course, is a color. We, we do just black and white. Um, and a lot of people ask about colors. Um, but we only we only manufacture black or white product, and um, there are people that do dye them different colors, and that works for them. And oh, yeah. um, it's Simple. easy to do. A, a little box of RIT dye and a tub of water, throw them in it, and they'll be different color inside of 15 minutes. So uh, it, it's pretty easy. <laughs> Excuse me, pretty easy to do. Um, yeah. So. If, if you look at uh, Miss Ruth, if, if you would show the crossing straps on the front of the boot, if you look at that, when that's on the horse's leg, if you'll put it on in that configuration, that's the same as you, you would athletically tape a horse's ankle. There will be an opportunity for no hyperextension if you put them on in that fashion. If you put them on in any other way, it's not going to work. Wow. Just, it just, and I see a lot of people put them on different. They put them on straight across. They don't cross it or make an X. And sometimes I saw people and ask them if they need help with that. And they tell me kindly, no. <laughs> 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 and they'll, I'll just go on my way. But um, yeah, no. if you make an X with it, it's going to do its job. So um, very important. Yeah. Well, and I've also got um, the bell boots here. Yeah. Okay. So bell boots. Bell boots, I'm going to be real with everybody about bell boots. Bell boots are bell boots. There is nothing special about a bell boot. It's a daggum bell boot. And I don't care how you cut it or shape it or size it or color it or whatever you do, it's a daggum bell boot. It's a bell boot that is close, that closes to make a circle. It's a round closure, and it fits on a round bone. If you don't think it can turn, go ride one. <laughs> The yeah. bugger can turn, and there's no way to really stop it if the right thing happens. Now, this little positioning knob, the button that's on the inside, that's supposed to fit between the bulbs of the horse's foot and hold it in position. It can work if the boot never lifts, okay? So if it raises up, so when it hits the ground, if it raises up, the positioning button is no longer effective and it can go wherever it wants to go. So what we have with that, with the Iconoclast boot, if you look at the boots on a horse, they, they go lower on the horse's leg than does a splint boot. A splint boot comes to the basically the bottom side of the fetlock joint. Mm -hmm. And then when the horse steps, the fetlock depresses and the bottom of the boot material on a splint boot will open up and allow dirt and trash to go up underneath it and, and do all the stuff that they do. The a conclass boot is another inch and a half longer than a splint boot. And so it actually engulfs a portion of P1 and P2 or the pastern bones on a horse's leg. So the bell boot fits on the pastern, right? So if you were to put the bell boot on first and the leg boot second, the leg boot will hold the bell boot down into position so it, it exactly so it's harder for it to turn than if you put it on the other way and under under a splint boot um yeah pretty good chance they're going to turn i mean not always but there's a pretty good chance they they, they can turn but if you put on bell boots before you put on our iconoclast boots there's a really good chance it's not going to be able to spin because the boot itself will hold that bell boot down in place now when wow. what happens what what happens when we look at this in the dynamics of motion we look at this bell boot and we go well, how did, how does it possibly turn well it hits the ground and it pushes it up the leg so it's got the ability to just spin on the bone well if it if the if the fabric of that bell boot is soft enough it'll flex when it hits the ground and it won't push up so easy it's apt to stay in place so the yeah. more rigid a bell boot is the more it's apt to climb up a horse's leg and turn and so when we put kevlar or if you get a hard cover or a shell on the outside 
that stuff makes it more rigid. The, and, and we do that, of course, because the horse, horse's back foot will impact that thing. It can tear it pretty easy. But uh, we, we do that to try to preserve the life of the thing a little bit. But, um, yeah, if, if you uh, put it on first, uh, there won't be so much chance of it to turn. But hard, hard-sided bell boots, I don't think they're all they, you want them to be. They, they have their problems. So yeah, just as an application idea and a benefit, do it first and then put the leg boots on and they'll they'll stay in a lot better place. That's really good information. And I love, every time you say help people help horses, it just makes my heart warm. <laughs> well, you know. But I'm convinced this is not just a plain old ordinary bell boot though, because when you have your hands on it, it feels, it feels better, like more substantial, as far as just the protective part within the boot itself. It feels you know, like I'm going to put this on my horse and they're going to be protected more than some of the other ones on the market. So I, 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 I think they're, you're, you're right in some regards that, that there's more life to these bell, the, to these boots than, than some other bell boots. And, um, and I, I won't disparage any other company, but um, you know, the, the, what, what really sets things apart in a lot of, a lot of manufacturing aspects is durometer of foam. So there's an EVA foam built or that, that, uh, bell boots made on and, and and it's a stiffer durometer so you can you can you can make that foam either stiffer or softer depending on how you mix it and so for our bell boots it's a little stiffer it's not it's not so soft it's really flexible but it's a little yeah. more rigid um but still flexible and um and, and in fact the the bell boot after some use will actually cave in at the top or that goes around the leg um, it'll actually uh, develop a concave shape around the foot. It's, it's kind of funny. It's almost like you poured a mold over the top of the uh, horse's foot. And so over the top of the, the, the heel bulbs and around the foot, that thing will mold into the shape of the foot. And, and um, it's funny after just a little bit of use that it does that. And I don't know that I've seen others do that. So um, I guess, again, the Lord watches out for me when I'm sleeping and I, come up and get stuff that I don't even realize sometimes but uh yeah yeah yep. but anyway you know and, and as far as the boots go too we, we did something else and I'm sure you all are aware of it in the store but for the consumer we offer uh uh different leg boots by way of the fact that we offer a a, a front boot a hind boot and an extra tall hind boot mm -hmm. and so our extra tall the, the regular hind boot has three upper straps, just like the boot that uh, Miss Ruth is showing there. Um, the extra tall has one more strap, so it has four straps and it goes up the leg two inches further than the regular hinds do, okay? So we did that under veterinarian recommendation some years ago when the, uh, in discussions, and, and when I, whenever I make modifications to the boots, it's, it's usually a doctor that's called me and we have this conversation about what we can do to change and, and how we can better the product or make another addition to something. And so we, we took the idea of, of uh, this doctor's and, and made an extra tall and tried it to find out if we could, in fact, affect what he was talking about. So we, we, we did, and we make that extra, extra tall, and we put them to test here. And the, the point in, in Doc's extra tall notion was that we could save the upper suspensory attachment from being sore on a horse or, or injured by putting that material up around it uh, where it started. So for those that aren't familiar with anatomy, ligaments connect bone to bone. Tendons connect muscle to bone. So at the top of a horse's leg, where the knee and the hock are concerned, the um, uh, superficial and deep digital tendons from the muscle come off the back side of the cannon bone and run the full length of the cannon bone down between the sesamoid bones, down P1 and P2 are your pasture bones, and then attached to the bottom side of the coffin bone in the horse's foot, okay? So the ligaments, the suspensory ligaments, are starting at the top of the carpus or the cannon bone just below the joint the knee or the hock is where they start and then they run full length of the cannon bone down to the fetlock they have a branch that wraps around the fetlock 
to bind it together. And then there's a branch then that runs off each side of the fetlock that goes down P1 and P2 and attaches to the top side of the coffin bone in the horse's foot. And that's a simplistic idea of the anatomy of the horse, right? But when you look at when you look at the 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 the, the parts of the horse's lower limb, there's like 28 ligaments below the knee and the hock. Wow. And there's three tendons. Okay, so we have three tendons, 28 ligaments. Any one of those ligaments can be damaged at any given time. And when we have a damaged ligament of some sort, we have a we have a seriously lame horse. Okay, that's going to take some recovery time. And the t and the tendons are no different. If they're damaged, they're going to take a long time to heal, um, or they can certainly. So anyway, with the with the tall boots, the the the, the idea that Doc had was that if I can engulf that leg of that part of the anatomy, the attaching point for the suspensory ligaments at the top of the cannon bone, into that boot, I can save those horses from having sore upper suspensories. And so we did that and we put it to trial and we found out it was very effective. It's 99% effective in guarding for or protecting those horses from upper suspensory soreness. Now, when we, we, we look at horses and we said, well, what's, what horses would have upper suspensory soreness? Well, any horse that works off a flexed hock then becomes the horse that has a propensity for upper suspensory soreness, okay? So a flexed hock, who's that? Well, that's all reining horses, all cutting horses, all rein cow horses, all jumpers, dressage horses when they're in maneuvers, barrel horses, as they come around the barrel, the inside leg is completely flexed at the hock, rope horses that break the box, calf horses that come out of a box, tie down horses, breakaway horses, you, I mean, all these disciplines. And it's not specific to Western style riding, it's specific only to the fact that it's a horse. You know, we make boots from small to 4X, and that means we make horse, we make boots from little horses up to draft horses. Because people are doing things with draft horses all the time, just like they are, and so it's any size. And, or, or, you know, for that matter, zebras, for crying out loud, we've, we've done that too. And, and so any, uh, anything that's equine, we can help. And, yeah. and so when, when we look at the anatomy and what that boot actually can do and start to, try, start to understand what's in play here when, when, we, when we start to ask them for their lives, there's a lot of stuff going on there and a lot of things can be hurt. And so the extra tall, is important by way of the fact that we can save the upper suspensory attachment and hold it harmless from injury by using that boot. Now, the extra tall doesn't fit every horse because sometimes horses have a shorter cannon bone. And so our normal hind boots on shorter cannon bone horses reach the point where they can assist in that and get to that suspensory attachment and keep it from being sore. So on the longer legged horses, they're just a little touch longer. They need the extra tall, so we go to extra tall. And most horses anyway on the hind leg are, have a longer cannon bone than does than the front, right? So a lot of them can use it, but some just can't. Now, where the boots are concerned too, the front boots, the hind boots, and the extra tall boots are all identical. The only difference is height. Wow. So on a horse, the front legs and the hind legs are made identical. There is no difference. Same tissues, same structure all the way through. There's not one little bit of difference at all. So you can take any of these boots and put them on any of the legs and it's fine. It does the right job. Back boots can go on the front legs. Front legs can go on the hind. It doesn't matter. It's the same. As long as it fits your height requirement, it can do the job. And so there's a lot of times we have horses that wear extra talls because they're a tall kind of a thoroughbred kind of horse that might be you know 16 hands or more or some such thing with long cannon bones and the extra tall works really good on the hind and this and you give them a regular set of front boots and it's kind of short well then use the high, regular hind boots on the front so they don't buy front boots they buy regular hind boots put them on the front extra talls on the back and they're covered clear to the attaching point and everything's golden so it, it works yeah. pretty well that way um the other thing that we found and this is kind of fun for any uh, reining horse people that are out there that might be interested. Um, the reining horse trainers that I've got use the extra talls on the front and the hind. And they, when they use them on the front, they actually take the top strap on the extra tall and they'll fold it back against the body so it's not attaching, but that 
extra material goes up about the base of the knee. So when a person needs a, a knee boot, if you use the extra tall, you'll put that material up over that contact point on that knee and you don't need to buy knee boots. Wow. So um, it's pretty slick. Yes. Yeah. They, they eliminate one piece of it. And knee boots, I don't, I don't know how many people have actually gone to rainings, but when you do and you look at some of the stuff that people do to try to protect those knees, um, that's a big deal. It, masking, or I mean, uh, duct tape and pillow wraps and, and knee boots and all kinds of stuff and, and hard to put on, hard to get off. And, and, and the stuff is, um, you know, maddening, I guess, to say the least, to try to put on. But that, you can put it on inside of seconds and it's done and it's perfectly effective and never a problem. Never spins out of position, never rolls, never sags, never does anything. It stays in the right spot so you never have a problem. And so that was that was a, I'm gonna just say, that was kind of an accident. We, we really didn't think about that. One of our great reigning horse trainers came up with the idea and um, I love him for it because it's, it was right on. You know, we make knee boots and they're, they're good. Um, we don't um, necessarily need them per se, because we have that, you know, yeah. but if, if, and again, if people want our knee boots, we're happy to sell them and, and we can ship them any day and they're very good. Um, but uh, again, that's, it's a fun find for, for just the boot itself. But I, I think that for the customers by and large, just remember that the feet or the legs of the horse are exactly the same front to back. There is no difference. It's, it's not a, it's not a, I'm going to go to jail if I put back boots on the front legs. That's, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so, or my horse is going to be crippled because I did it. That's not going to happen either. So um, it, it, the anatomy is the same. It's just the intent of what you want to do. So as, as users, owners, I would just suggest get, become very familiar with what you're using on your horses, why you use it, how you use it, how long you use it. You know, we have people say, well, gosh, are they hot? because there's no holes in them and um, they need to breathe and the horse's legs get too hot and they sweat underneath it and, and those kinds of things. And, and th you're right, they do. They sweat underneath that material because it's neoprene rubber. And so it doesn't breathe. And when you put them on, that horse's legs gonna be wet underneath it. Mm -hmm. And that's normal. And the thing that we, the thing that we know is this over time, is that in order for us to develop tissue damage, we have to elevate the core temperature of the tissue in order to cause any damage, right? And so there's lots of studies been done through different universities across the United States that says, yeah, core temperature can't exceed this particular temperature. And I don't know that one study or another comes out with the same temperature. I've read many of them and they don't. It's a little inconsistent in that regard, although high is high. And when we ask ourselves, well, what is high? Um, it really depends on whether or not it's, whether the horse is in motion or whether he's standing. Now, if we, if we take it, here's, a, here's an example of heat. A horse with no boots on, standing at 95 degree temperatures outside in the sun will temp at about 84, 85 degrees. So if we put a boot, our boot, Iconoclast, on that horse working for an hour in that hot sun, Take the leg temperature when you stop after an, after the hour, and the temperature goes to about 95 degrees. So we got a 10 degree raise, okay? Not significant. When we look at putting liniment on a horse's leg to reduce inflammation, mm -hmm. and we put a one inch thick polo wrap and a standing bandage on him and cellophane or newspaper or path, you know paper bag or whatever you're gonna put on it, you put all this component together and you wrap it around the horse's leg and the temperatures exceed 125 degrees. Wow. And we leave it on 12 or 14 hours. Yep. And we call it therapy for pity's sake. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. So where then do we find core temperatures that can exceed 126 degrees or 125 degrees in our working environment? I say we can't, but here's the oversight. And I'm probably going to catch a lot of flack over this, but I, I think that the oversight comes largely with the idea of fatigue. Because if the muscle is fatigued, if the horse gets tired and we have muscle fatigue, that means the blood oxygen level is decreasing. 
if the blood oxygen de level is decreasing, the response to the tendons that connect the muscle to the bone is being inhibited. If the tendon performance is inhibited, the ligaments then are also going to be inhibited. And the horse is more likely then to have a hyperextensive move that will cause the damage to the long tissues of that leg. So it has little to do with heat and more to do with fatigue, in my opinion. Doesn't mean it can't be too hot. I see people that leave them on for hours on end, standing horses in the sun, tied to a fence with leg gear on, and they shouldn't. Yeah. If you're using your horse and you stop using your horse and you're getting off, pull those leg boots off, let that leg air out. When you get ready to go again, put them back on. It takes a minute and a half to put them back on. It's not a time thing. It's yeah. only an effort thing. And so remove them when you get off, put them back on when you get back on or prior to getting on. And yeah. uh, you will do your horse justice in doing that. And um, those kinds of things just being smart about the management of your care of your horse will save him uh more often than you know um mm -hmm. so um i i think that you know people getting acquainted with the product our product or any product for that matter but learn learn as much as you can about how to use it and and um if you have any questions either call somebody that that is that is knowledgeable about the fact and and um or call the people that make it and have them explain it to you about how it works and i, I think you get a lot of mileage from it you know yeah. we we get we get asked again like how how long can i leave them on our rehab situations in our rehab boots when people have horses in recovery they say i don't have a stall to keep my horse in and i need to turn him out in a turnout how long can the boots stay on the horse and so what becomes important is that it's not really a matter of how long we keep the, the boots on the horse, it's how often do we check the boots on the horse, right? And so we can leave them on, on labeling, I'll, I'll put on there, you know, four to five hours is, is maximum time you wanna leave them on the horse without attending. Um, and so people call and I say, gosh, I can't be home. You know, I have to leave in the morning, I go to work and I come back at night and I'm not here for eight hours. I'm worried about that. If I turn the horse out and they got the boots on. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that that's not the best of scenarios, but if that's all you can do, that's probably all you can do. But if you could have somebody just walk by there and pull them off for an hour and then put them back on, that's all you really need to do is let that leg air out for a little bit so we can avoid skin sensitivities. It's yeah. not gonna hurt the tissue necessarily or do some structural damage, but it could develop a skin sensitivity and that thing, kind of thing we wanna avoid. So on off, get them off when you're done riding, put them on when you get back in, or you're fixing to get back in the saddle and, and you'll be good to go. Um, but yeah, heat, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to describe something. I, I hope, I hope I don't insult anybody, but I, I'm going to describe something I found the other day. There's a new product in the market, a new boot, and it says it has this cool material, right? So it's all perforated and you look at it and it's clearly perforated material. But when you, when you try to blow through it, it doesn't take, you can't blow through the material. So I question how does it get air if you can't if I can't blow through the thing how the devil is air going to get through that and so yeah. I looked at the boot and on the inside so the outside was two millimeter neoprene with holes perforated in it saying it's a cool thing for the horse's leg but on the inside of the boot is three millimeters of foam a foam sheet so on the back side inside the boot it totally covers all of the holes of the outside <laughs> it, it doesn't make it's no cool anything it's, yeah. <laughs> i mean so yeah labeling and, and advertising i don't <laughs> sometimes it's not all they say it is so uh I, I i ask people to just look it over really close and see if it is what you want you know for our body again our, we're not perforated um i thought about it at one time and then when i when i tried the sample I tried to blow through it with all the perforated holes. I couldn't blow through it. And I thought, what's the, what's the point? If yeah. I can't blow through it, there's no air moving through that thing. It's not cool. It's so it's, it's nothing. And so I couldn't make myself do that. And so anyway, our bodies, our boots are made out of six, six millimeter neoprene. It's the heaviest neoprene in the business. It's the stoutest stuff that's out there. And it's, it's actually 
beneficial to support. It offers something by way of support to the horse's leg to keep those things from hyperextending during use and avoiding the opportunity for injury. So um, that's kind of a long story, but um, anyway. No, Ward. And if anyone's joined us, I this is Ruth Jeffers, and we've got Ward from Iconoclast on the live shopping with us today. And he's been so much information about. I have learned so much. Yeah, yeah. it's been great. Yeah, this has been awesome. Yeah. You know, I, th I think one of the other subjects I'm going to I'm going to just touch on this because I, I think if we have people watching, they should really understand this because it's really important. And that is the, the foot balance. The, the the foot balance of the horse is critical. OK, and by that, it's not so much medial lateral, but it is uh, front to back. So. Um, too long a toes will cripple a horse. And so if you're letting your horse, if you if you have your horse shod and you're letting him go until the shoes are loose and ready to come off to reset or if you're going past the time and space where the where the growth has exceeded its its balance potential if the foot's too long or if the toe is too long you're creating more depression at the fetlock because the fulcrum takes longer to move or break over on a long toe than it does a short toe so if you want your horse to stay sound more sound make yeah. sure the toes on your horse stay short if they do, the horse will last longer. If they get long, not so much. And a horse with long pasterns, even more important, then, then you need to have a, a farrier help you understand what's going on in dynamics of footfall so that horse doesn't hyperextend as well. Because a longer pastern horse has a longer delay and breakover, and somehow along the way, you need to increase that. And I could get into an hour's discussion about footfall and, and about how to shoe that horse and what, what we need to do to make that horse break over proper front and hind in order to help him be better and stay sound. But that's another subject, I guess. So um, we didn't, you know, what we haven't talked about, Miss Ruth, is our saddle pads. Um, okay. Yeah, we, so so we brought a saddle pad to market, and, and and since you asked me the backstory on on the boots, I'll give you a little backstory on the saddle pads. And um, the, the the backstory on the saddle pads is that I was so disgusted because we train horses. I train horses. We we, we work horses every morning, and so we train horses here and then uh, go about our days. But uh, uh, the, that being said, I've tried different saddle pads. Um, in you know from different companies and and I, I I got to the point where I was just disgusted because everything I was trying whether it was expensive or not expensive didn't matter but what I found was after a, a, a limited per, uh, period the dang things would slip or roll and or create dry spots on a horse's back and I, I finally got to the place where I, I was just a, a little mad about it and I, I said to my wife I'm gonna find a way to make a saddle pad that doesn't do this stuff and get away from it and I don't care if I ever sell any if I'll just make them for myself and if nobody else wants to use them. So I, I stumbled around and I found some stuff that I thought I wanted to have it made from or have pads made from. I tried it. We sampled the things and I used them here as samples for two years to see if they were legit. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, my chiropractor does not work on my horse's backs anymore. And wow. no, never had any sores and never had a roll never had a slip and we train cutters here so we're asking a fair bit from these these horses and um i have no sore backs no dry spots no back adjustments and the pads are going to last i don't know i used some for five years before i finally gave them to a, a guy that could continue oh, wow. to use them. I, I just went and got some other ones but uh, they're, they're 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 very nice if you need to clean them, you put them down on the concrete, wash them with a pressure washer. They're clean. They're they're one inch felt um, with a the longest fleece available in the market. And, and and I think there's a little difference there between others. The fleece on other some other saddle pads is generally shorter. Um, but we use uh, 31 30 seconds, so it's almost an inch long. Uh, the fleece when. Uh, that, that we use on our, our pads. So um, uh, I, I, I won't say absolutely no one else uses it, but I've never seen it if they have. Um, but uh, th that, that fleece is phenomenal and it does an excellent job and it holds up well. And the pads, um, you know, from our professionals to our amateurs to whatever, um, 
you don't have a break-in period. You don't. You don't have. You take it out of the bag. You put it on your horse, and it'll feel the same way when you ride it the first time as it does the thousandth time. So um, uh, have a look at those saddle pads. There, uh, I think that you'll. Anybody that gets one will be really pleased. So cool. Do we carry their saddle pads? Um, I think we're out of stock you, right now. Oh, we're, we're sold out. Yeah. On the saddle yeah. Pads. You you've had them there. So yeah. So yeah. I noticed that I didn't see any on the side and sometimes we do sell out of stuff during live shopping and, but we can sure get them well, back. I, I, I like the fact that you sell out because that that's a phone call away from <laughs> getting, you, getting you a restock. You know, yeah, you get a bunch of hearts for that. So, yeah. get a bunch so you know, I, I'll say this then too. So I've, I've been long winded and we're about to run out of time, but. Now um, this has been so much good information. I, I think that, um, you, you know, you know this too, but for any listeners out there, if there's something that we have that's in production and you call Jeffers for an order, they can simply pick up the phone or send us an email and get whatever you need. And we deliver within 24, we'll, we'll send it out within 24 hours and they'll have it for you. So it's, it's a real quick, quick turnover. There's no delays here. We're, we're very proficient about how we get things out or we certainly try to be and so yeah don't don't hesitate to contact jeffers if you need something and they don't have it in stock it's a phone call away awesome now, kim do you have any more questions because we've had so much good information today and we've actually um ward had a lot of folks watching for a lot longer than normal today so it says that there's a lot of um interest in the information and i think that's so much like helping people help horses and um, a lot of the folks this week have talked about treating your horse you know as your partner and not as your servant and right you know that's so much what you're talking about is being yeah, thoughtful of your horse ab absolutely couldn't agree more i the, 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 and again th those are longer discussions for for uh, in many different approaches so um at, at any time um, I am happy that you invited me to do this, Miss Ruth. I, 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 I was a little nervous about it, but I, you, you made it so fun. And I'm, 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 I'm really tickled to be able to share with an audience what we do and, um, and, and help them make some really good decisions about their horses. And, and just know that, it, um, again, if people have questions about product, um, they can email us, uh, they can email me direct at ward at, uh, uh, westernlegacysales.com and um, or contact Jeffers Equine. They'll help you as much as they can. If they can't answer a question, they know where to find the answer and they'll they'll get back to you with it. And um, but but we're here to serve our clients and uh, help them as much as we possibly can. And we're we're privileged to have a partner like Jeffers in in, in business with us. Oh, thank you, Ward. And I really appreciate you being here. And just to recap a little bit because we actually have more viewers now than we did at the beginning was this patented, um, Sling this is patented. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. If you want to just kind of touch base a little bit and I love the information I didn't know was putting on your bell boot first. And maybe yeah. did you know that? Nope. I did not. I like and backwards. you would think I, I did me too. I would, had done it backwards in the past. So, yeah, it's, a, it's just a little quicker, a little quicker way. You know, something else I might just, just share this. It, it, the, the double sling stra straps are, that's a patented design on that boot. So nobody else has that design. There's some boots that do have crossovers, um, but they're a little made just a little bit different. And um, yeah, I think that um, in all fairness, if you want to look at them, look at them and hold one against the other and decide which one's worth buying. And then um, uh, as, as far as the Velcro, we've had some people say, gosh, I can't get them off. It's, it's, you know, some ladies will say, I'm breaking my nails trying to get these things off. And um, so yeah. if if a person, <laughs> yeah, so so if a person would, see, I thought I had one here. Yeah. Um, if, if a person would take, if you would take, if y'all can see this, can you see this? On the, on the back of this this Velcro strip, if you take a cigarette lighter and you melt this just a little bit on that edge. Yeah. Right, right there, just a little bit on this edge. Uh, oh, wow. If you'll melt those hooks off, you can now get a hold of that thing anyhow, any anytime without tearing a nail. <laughs> so, 
So, yeah. So, yeah, just touch the edge with a little cigarette lighter and just melt it, and there you go. Wow. You'll peel it off. You'll peel it off, That's and you won't break your hack. fingernails. Yeah. That's yeah. perfect. That's I such know. an easy hack. This is great. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. That's a hack, isn't it? I, yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, lots of good um, information. Um, and I will remind folks, there is 20% off just for today. We mm -hmm. still have the bell boots. We still have the support boots. And these are our support boots versus splint boots because they actually yes. do support your horse. Well done. Well said. <laughs> awesome. Well, Ward, is there anything else you want to share with everybody? I think for today, I'll, I'll close with the, what I've done so far. But... Um, Maybe, maybe by the grace of God, you'll offer a, a chance for me to do it again. Oh, I'd love oh, to have you that'd back. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yes. And that's really the, when we started live shopping, the objective was to have fun, share the love, um, and just, you know, hopefully folks are learn something, they're entertained a little bit. And then, you know, I always kind of end with like, tell someone you love them and God bless because, you know, life is, Amen. is you know, we just we, encourage each other and love each other and pray for each other. And we do we, a lot we, of praying for each other around here. Amen. We, we do the same here. We never know when that day comes. He told us long ago, we don't know the day or the time. So be ready. Yeah. It could happen. And enjoy well, yourself cool. well, while you're here. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah, going to look and make sure I don't have any questions anywhere. And I don't see any questions. But you've definitely, Ward, we've had a lot of folks watching today. And that's a lot of fun. And I have learned... I wish I would have had, like, I feel like I've been in class all week because I would have been a much better bell racer and a much better partner to my horse if I had all the information I've learned this week as far as supporting my horse. And the, just the anatomy of horses, I'd not never, I've seen like skulls and things of horses, but I never really thought about how that anatomy impacts my horse. Yeah, or the products we use yeah. on them, how it affects them, yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a direct there's a certainly a direct correlation, and um, um, I, I've been, like I said, on a on a on a steep incline on the learning curve when it comes to all of this stuff. I still you know learn, find out new things every day about um, anatomy and and function and form and footfall and all these things that I never thought about or um, had to try to do. We actually had a, a little project here where I had to shoe a horse uh, in a way that the the, the vet suggested. Excuse me, and I thought I thought it was odd, but um, for for my first attempt at it, I, I I built this set of shoes for this guy and put them on him, and um, it's perfect. It works perfect, but always always under the guise that I'm trying to learn more, you know, to, yeah. to, to find out what helps what helps these horses stay safe and continue to perform, and um, it's a good thing. Cool. Well, I appreciate you being here. Um, Ward is the founder of Iconoclast Boots, and um, I don't see any questions. So what I'll do is, Ward, I'll go ahead and start to turn everything off. And um, But I sure appreciate you being here, and you're welcome to hang up at any time. You've been amazing. And, you know, for our customers, if you want to reach out to him, my email is ruth.jeffers at jeffers jefferspet.com and ward at legacy western, western legacy sales western legacy sales.com because if you want to have questions or he sounds a lot like us if you have suggestions for me email me a lot of folks do if you've got suggestions for ward about his boots he would love to hear from you absolutely so well have an amazing day you do the same thank, thank you thank you so much ward and we're god bless y'all you too thank you.